Now, here we are in early January talking about food plot seed, and uh, there's a whole lot of people that plant food plots. Not the timing that we usually put out food plot um, seed videos, food plot planting video strategy, but really critical because in having our own food plot company, WHS Wildlife Blends, and opening up our first sales last year, we had uh, sales uh, to customers. Thank you so much, everyone, um, in, in 43 states. Um, it's just been blown out of the water how much feedback we've had and how many sales we've had. It's been incredible to the person, you know, we have to hire a full-time person this year um, or two, and uh, it's really taken off. But bottom line, in, in our projections and working with seed distributors, I uh, really find it out that uh, those uh, February seed sales are really starts to take off then, February, March, that's not that far away. And I really want to help you guys um, whether you buy my seed that we offer or not, we have, we're going to have 12, 13 different seed varieties or combinations this year. Um, I really want to keep you on the right path, uh, straight and narrow, as you might say. And so that's really important to me to give you good information. Um, I'd rather you appreciate the information, the teaching we have. And if you buy seeds elsewhere, that's, that's fine. Uh, bottom line is I want you to have good food plots and there's no need to fail. These, some of these things will keep you from failing uh, by following these, these 10 uh, best food plot seed practices. Number one, it's typically not the latest fad. There's a lot of fads that have come and gone. I've been planting food plots since literally right around 94, 95, right around in that time frame. So a very long time, almost 20 or 30 years, uh, which is crazy to think of. And during that time, you can imagine all the fads and, uh, and really poor planting practices I've seen come and go. And, uh, and a lot of them, you know, they might even be a good uh, seed or seed variety planted in the right soil, but the, eater, the deer eat it down to the dirt before hunting season and it doesn't have, offer any value to wildlife or deer or to the landowner strategies or expected strategies. So a lot of times it might be a good food source at one time of the year, but it's not at a time where it's actually gonna help you in any way or the deer. So there's a lot of different things that you can fall victim with the latest fad, but if you're seeing it and you haven't heard about it before, explore it, explore the source, explore the region, explore the soil type, how many acres they have planted, what else do they have planted in the area, what kind of deer herd is there already, will give you some indication of this is a fit for your area because a lot of times when you start looking at the variables that made that successful in one area, your land doesn't meet very many variables. And that doesn't mean your land is bad, it's just that everyone has so many different variables from one property to the other. By the time you put the complexity of 10 or 12 variables together, it's hard to get those same set of variables everywhere. There's always something changing, something different, even from one landowner to the next. If anyone's saying, including myself, if I say you need to have this type of seed at a rate of 20%, 10%, 50%, of all your food plats on your land, anywhere, immediately run like the wind. You have to avoid those types of conversations that really lack credibility for even promoting the seed in the first place. There's no one seed type that I can re recommend that I have in my own plantings. And this is with someone with a lot of experience. I literally for my career, for my profession, I create food plot programs and really recommend food plot programs for clients around the entire country. That's what Dylan does, Joe does, Kevin Smith does out of Pennsylvania. We as a group, we'll see over 300 clients this year. We're going to recommend based on their time, the resources, all these factors here that we'll talk about in a little bit, what they should plant. And for that, we get to learn because this isn't, we just come in blind and say, this is what you need to plant based on what Jeff sells. That's not the way it works. This is what you need to plant. That's why I like being able to have my own seed company because I'll go to a client and say, don't buy any of this stuff, buy this, mix this, do this, buy this product, but do this to it. You can really customize it to them. And that's why every client is so different but that's literally what we do for a living is recommend seed planting programs for our clients and then we get to learn because they get to tell us their successes and failures and then we make a, make a recommendation for them based on our own level of experience. But you'll find there's no one seed or no one product that you should plant everywhere. And I'm not going to tell you there is even to get you to buy something from mine. It's, it'd be totally disingenuous. Number three, think of all these factors that we have to consider and these are just some of them. What type of soil do you have? What type of pH level? I didn't even write that down. The number of deer you have in your area. High deer population, low. What region are you in? What's actually gonna grow in your area the best? 
the total acres you have under management, how many total acres you're planting, and what are your resources of time and money? What kind of planting equipment do you have? How much money do you want to spend for the year? How much time do you have to plant? What kind of equipment are you planting? All these are factors that go into really helping you individually on your land to pick what best food plot seed is for you to plant versus what your neighbor might be doing, just two neighbors or one neighbor away. Always consider the best green base. Why did I not say always plant clover, always plant brassica, always plant peas, always plant cereal grains of rye, wheat, or oats, always plant tillage radish, always plant buckwheat, always plant hairy vetch, always plant birch foot tree fly, always plant alfalfa. Because it's whatever green base you're going to have that's growing appreciably in October, November, and you can literally bring the deer through the entire deer season with the amount of green you have, that's what green you should plant. And you should do it in the most diversity you can, and you typically should do it in two different plantings. We have more of a green base over here, green blend, cereal grain blend, and then over here we have a brassica base. That's what a lot of times you're gonna have two bases like that going into the season. Now you might find in an area uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, clover can do really well all the way through December because you're just not getting the frost and freeze to slow that clover growth. You're getting more volume you're bringing into November. Where in northern Minnesota, upstate New York, UP and Michigan, that might be down to the dirt by mid-September because they've had an early frost in early September. Every bite isn't replaced. There's no other farms in the area. And you can kind of see the picture. This gets very complex for what you should plant. But the green base that gives you the most volume and deer like throughout the entire season, that should always be your base. Look at your food plot triangle. This doesn't focus on any one product. Green, so this is always green at your base. Then corn if you have room. And then something like a perennial beans, summer food that you need to build a summer herd, that would come last. So I'm not going to tell you any one of those, any one of those products will fit that. In fact, I don't have one product that I can say, unfortunately, you buy this, this is what you have to plant all the time. Get the best green base for your area and go from there. Number five, has to be fall focused. A lot of people that spend way too much time thinking they need to help the health of the herd and we're very arrogant at that. Meaning we're not gonna help the health of the herd during the summertime. Now in the Southwest, arid portions of the Southern states, Southern states, it might be that you can offer food at a time during the summer when there's really a lot of drought and it's a it's a brown time in the woods not a lot of green because there's no rain and that might be a food source at that time that's really important to deer when they're growing their antlers but the further north you get there's an overabundance by several times of high quality food during the summer months and the deer don't need your food plot in fact if you have a lot of food during the summer in most areas there's actually a negative return because you put too many does on your land at the expense of bedding cover and space for the fall. Also, your fall crops come in, which let's face it, the food you have during the fall is what actually builds a herd, builds sex ratios, help you maintain a population of deer in balance with the habitat, helps you grow older bucks because you can actually save them, protect them, advance them to the next age class. That's all done in the fall not during the summer. If you attract too many does and fawns during the summer and create a fawning ground called a doe factory, you're gonna have too many deer that linger around in the fall. It's good to have balance, but not too many. That's the number one way to reduce deer population if you need to, is to get rid of the summer food. But bottom line is you have to have your food peaking in October, November, and if you're doing, if you're planting summer food at the expense of that fall time period, then you're really doing a disservice to not only yourself and your hunting, but the herd as well. So always focus on that fall forage. That's the lowest hole in the bucket. You always plug that first. A lot of people put a lot of focus into summer food, which is at the top of the bucket, and they're ignoring that hole in the bottom of fall and winter. Number six, avoid kitchen sink blends. Jack of all trades, master of none. That's what a kitchen sink blend is. They even have summer soil builder programs where they have, which are really bad. You know, now that we've, some of those have been out for a while, I see the empty fields in the summertime. You see the lack of actual ground cover. There's no smother crop for weeds. Just because this plant does this thing and this does this and this does this, when they're at small percentages, less than 10%, less than 20% within a mix, then their effect is dilute, diluted because it's not that one area of goodness creeps over into the other area of the soil has to be more of a monoculture approach. That's why straight buckwheat is great. If you can actually plow down something, that buckwheat is great when you're allowing it to grow for six to eight weeks, depending on your soil, maybe even five weeks. But if you're gonna let it sit there for two and a half months, need more of a cover crop. Need fine organic matter. What does that mean? 
Sunflowers are not fine organic matter. Sorghum is not fine organic matter. The king of all not fine organic matter is corn. Lots of organic matter, but it takes a long time to break down. It takes a lot of nutrients. You're actually doing yourself disservice. Rye, when you let rye get five or six feet tall in the summertime, it is a large mass of non-fine organic matter and that's really bad. You wanna kill that rye when it's two, three feet and that's what we do. We always mow it or kill it out in the springtime and then we put a fine organic matter plant like buckwheat in there. So we have a soil builder that is based on fine organic mat matter seed varieties so that it can be plowed down in two and a half months. You don't have those big masses and it's more of a ground cover, which is really important because that helps you limit your weeds during that growing period too as well. So very important that you're not falling for these kitchen sink plants. And that goes for the fall plantings too, where yeah, brassica is good, cereal grains are good. You never mix cereal grain meaning rye, wheat, or oats with um, a brassica blend. That's just, you don't, the two, now it could be that there's 10 pounds per acre of oats and then you have brassica. The oats are gonna amount to a little bit, but they're not gonna fight each other too much. But there's a reason that brassica turns yellow when you mix it with rye because it, there's weed suppressant in the rye. It actually outcompetes the brassica and turns it, stunts it, turns it colors, and it never really grows appreciably for any kind of offering. So you don't mix those two. A lot of um, kitchen sink blends have 10, 12, 15 varieties, and they're doing nothing as a whole because they're offered in such little quantity around the entire field that there's no really good portion of the field working for you at a six or eight week window because they're just small contributions here and there. A lot of those contributions fight each other and actually hurt growth and volume in the end. Coatings. This is a really interesting one. You know how seed companies improve their profit margins? They'll sell you 10 pounds of clover. You don't read on the back on the label where it says there's 35% inert matter. We've seen up to 50% inert matter. You know what that means? Coating. You know what the coating is? Lime. That's not an inoculant. That's just a filler. It's coated with lime that clover seed so that they can reduce, basically sell you seven pounds of seed instead of 10. Now your profit margin is better for that seed company. And you know what, you as a hunter, almost every one acre plot we go to is actually a half acre or three quarters of an acre. And I'm not saying some people don't measure it out exact, but most of the time people well overshoot, everything's an acre. So half acre, three quarters of an acre turns into an acre. So that means if you plant 10 pounds of clover that's supposed to be 10 pounds per acre. There's actually only seven in the bag, but you have a half acre, you plant it over anyways. You're never gonna know the difference that there wasn't enough clover in that bag, but you paid for it. You got 30% less clover. So always look at the coatings in the bag. Now, some bird's foot tree foil, we have that in one of our clover mixes. It's really good northern wet damp soil blend like Alcite Clover too. It's a good combination. For bird's foot trail, tree foil needs to be inoculated. Instead of you pulling out that seed, if it's in a blend, it's a lot easier for you to inoculate that bird's foot tree foil ahead of time. So that makes up part of that coating in the bag. So it's hard not to have a perennial mix like that with clovers and bird's foot tree foil without having a little bit in there. But when you start looking at 30%, 25%, 40% coating, Again, it's just seed companies trying to take your money from you and trying to improve their profit margin because lime around seed, we need two tons of lime per acre, not three pounds that was in your bag of clover for an acre. Two tons, three pounds doesn't do anything at all. Literally a grain of sand in a beach. Number eight, throw and grow, or I like to call them throw and die. What does that mean? People take food plot locations and there's actually this marketing out there that you can take this throw and go product. You just throw it out there let it grow and it's gonna grow you a food plot. Something will grow in there. They put a kitchen sink blend in there. You might see a little bit of green. A lot of times they use ryegrass, which is bad. And you see a little bit of green, oh, this job. 90% of it died, it was a waste of time, and it's not even a draw. You have to prepare the soil, you have to control weeds, you have to address your pH. That's why we use uh, deer grow. Very important, that's what we use. You can use that on an annual basis instead of putting a bunch of lime out, tons of lime, um, which is nice if you have a truck coming and do it, but when you have to do it by hand like I've done in the past, I don't like doing that. But bottom line is that takes a place of that, but you have to address the pH, you have to address um, the plants being able to take up the nutrients, that's where we go with deer grow. And, uh, but you have to take care of, you have to have open soil, you have to be, have good seed to soil contact. You have to pick the right seed for your region, for the planting time, you have to get moisture to it. You have to get sunlight to it, and that's where it gets into number nine, shady mixes. We're not gonna sell a shady food plot mix because if there's so much shade that you think you need a shady food plot mix, 
you need to open up and get sunlight to it because there is the rye. Rye will grow halfway decent, kind of, in the shade, so will clover. But you take an acre that you have mostly shade on, just get an hour of sunlight a day, and you're gonna have so little volume and food in that acre that the deer aren't even going to be attracted to it unless they're just attracted to an open one acre field in the woods. That's about it. That's why we don't offer shady food plot mixes. Use a good food plot mix and get sunlight into it. Cut trees on the south side, make sure you get enough sun in there for at least five to six to seven hours a day. And then buy a food plot mix that'll actually give you volume to attract deer, which is your whole goal. Now we might have some shady trail mixes where we're trying to hold soil around a water hole in the woods, maybe a trail in the woods, but I'll tell you, we even fight with those. Where you keep putting down grass, like being your lawn, clover mixes, mix those two together, and you'll get a very sparse representation of that seed planting unless you get sunlight into it. So right now we're working on a lot of our trails getting sunlight into it. Not that we can plant food plots, we wanna actually have more of a lawn slash clover setting that deer won't eat because there's uh, low appreciation of clover and a lot of grass mixed in. And finally, that leads me to number 10. The reason we're planting rye grass and grass in our trails is because we don't want deer there while we're accessing stands on those same trails. And the reason we don't want deer there too is coupled with the fact that we don't want deer spread out all over the property potentially feeding. We want them to go to direct feeding locations. So by putting rye grass there, we can expect deer not to be there and that's why you don't want it in your food plot. If you think that lawn grass and rye grass, and I know it's different, there's grazing rye grass. Um, there could be some areas where I can think of high deer density areas down in the south, extremely high deer density, where they just can't get any other food source to grow. They'll plant rye grass there and at least they have a green lawn out there. It's something for the deer. They're basically starving. They have one fawn for every doe instead of two. The herd is not balanced. They're they're out competing and eating the local vegetation and habitat. It's a really bad thing. And so, yeah, in those cases, ryegrass can work. Where there's excess of deer numbers just about anywhere, ryegrass might be a fit. And I'm talking about ex very high excess deer numbers. But it's usually not the fit in 99% of all, and it shouldn't be a fit. That's why we plant it in areas we don't want deer. So really look at all these things, start to consider. You know, the food plot blends that we come up with at WHS Wildlife Blends will be good quality mixes. We're not putting these fillers and garbage in them for you. Our complete lineup of seeds will be available on the website and for purchase right around mid-February, the, the first shipments will go out the end of February, early March. So look for that coming on our website soon. Please check out our Hunting Hills and Thermals the latest web class and my food plot books, food plot web class. Those are all out there too. Uh, make sure you check out, um, we have right here, kickingbear.org, the kids group that we really, they're, they're all over the country. They help many kids get into hunting, families get in the outdoors. Check out kickingbear.org. You can get these calendars here. There's a number on the back of your calendar. You can register that on the site and then they can draw your name once a month and they have all kinds of prizes from sponsors here. There's a lot of companies, even competing companies of different kinds of bows or arrows, whatever, that helps support Kicking Bear because it's a great organization for youth. That's who we have our Father's Day charity event. We will have that again this year, so look for information out. 50 people will pay to come and be a part of the habitat portion. We have a hunt drawing that takes place that for a lucky winner. Tyler won this year, got to come out. He actually shot a buck on the property. We had a great time. Ta boy. Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? But um, we'll do that again this year too. All proceeds go to Camp Kicking Bear. I believe in Kicking Bear enough that we give 1% of all, we're giving 1% of all our gross sales for food plot seed to Kicking Bear this year. And uh, so we've donated over 50,000 to them the last two years because of those habitat days and great people like you showing up for that event. We appreciate it. And bottom line is we wanna help you out. Whether you buy this, our seed or not, make sure you're really going into this food plot season, eyes wide open and right now is a great time to plan for your 2023 food plot program. 
Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to, this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.